So for today, we will have uh, the task to design an app for uh, field data collection. The objectives of this uh, class of today is that you'll be able to, after this class, use QGIS to set up a surveying project to configure map themes with online and offline layers because uh, sometimes you'll have an internet connection, uh, probably most of the time not. So how do we configure uh, things to be used offline? To design the field form, QGIS has many nice options as you will see to uh, design uh, forms in, for the attribute table and the app can take over those forms. Then how to synchronize your QGIS project with the merging cloud service um, to have your uh, whole project in the cloud and then synchronize a mobile app, the input app that we're going to use with the cloud service so you have basically your QGIS project uh, in uh, your mobile phone to use for field surveying, which uh, will be the next uh, thing that uh, you'd be able to do using uh, the input app for surveying. And after surveying, getting back that data into the cloud and into your QGIS project to further process for analysis. So as uh, groundwater specialists, you know that uh, not all the data that you need is available online. So uh, everything we learned yesterday is very useful, but a lot of data is probably lacking and you need to go out there uh, by yourself in the field. And uh, if, uh, if you need to map for groundwater studies, then uh, often you need to, uh, to map features such as uh, springs, wells and boreholes, but maybe also other things um, that are useful for your study. And we also want to link other properties to uh, these features. For springs, for example, are these uh, unprotected or protected uh, springs? If we have wells or boreholes, we want to know the depth uh, of it. We also want to know the water level. We want to know the elevation of the, um, the borehole or well, well compared to the surface. Uh, so we have a lot of reference data. And in the end, we can further process this data uh, when we are back from the field into uh, groundwater models or do other things with that. Now, traditionally, uh, as you see on the picture, we do that with field forms that we uh, print out. Uh, it's very important to design them well before going to the field, to have a good field plan, because you know that logistics are uh, difficult, field logistics, and it's expensive. So if you forget something and going back is very expensive. So the preparation phase uh, is a very good investment. And GIS can play a very important role in designing your uh, field experiments or your field surveys. Um, you definitely need to, uh, to have base maps with all the roads and uh, to track where you are in the field and to, uh, to know where you're going every day, uh, where you expect the wells and boreholes and springs to be. So preparation is important and then design your field form, print them out many times and uh, yeah, keep copies. But we are now, of course, in the age where things are going more digital and uh, there are some advantages of digital mapping. It's quicker in the field, so you don't have to have this field book and then uh, write down all the answers to the, uh, to the questions that you have in the field form, but you can simply use an app and uh, tap the right answers in a prepared field form that you really designed to make it efficient to, to use in the field. You can have conditional questions on paper, of course, you need to use your brains to think, okay, now it's a, a borehole, so I can put the depth for a spring, I don't do that. But in a field form, in a digital format, you can put these conditions. If it's a well, then ask the depth. If it's a spring, then hide the question to ask the depth or don't allow to fill it in. What is also very nice is that you can register pictures with the data collection points. That's also something you will do uh, with the app that we are going to design today. And then uh, everything is together in one uh, database, uh, which is uh, all linked together with your data uh, that you collect from the field. It's very easy, but also important to make digital backups. And you can do that from the field once you have internet connection to synchronize back to the cloud or to uh, make an uh, offline backup on a USB stick that you can plug into your device or you synchronize locally to your computer. These things are uh, all possible. Uh, while with a paper form, um, yeah, 
probably in the evening when you're back from the field, you will make your uh, copies or you make pictures with your mobile phone and uh, it's all not very easy and it's not uh, completely uh, computer readable. So that will be a bit difficult to process. With digital uh, field forms, we can also fill in the defaults automatically. So if you have a field, uh, for example, on the, the person who is doing the data collection and for the whole campaign, it's the same person, then you can already fill it in. Uh, there are also automatic things that we can do, like filling in the, the date and the time uh, when you just start filling in the field at a point instead of typing that. So it's easy to synchronize it with GIS software. There's no need to uh, digitize it first. In the past, you need to digitize every point. So you have the coordinates on paper, then you need to put it in a spreadsheet or CSV and then import it like you learned yesterday to further uh, process it. In, the, in this case, you will just simply synchronize your project from your phone to the cloud, from the cloud to QGIS, and then uh, you will have your whole data set uh, in your project that you can further use. There's another thing here that I, I forgot to mention, an extra bullet, is that you also automatically collect the GPS coordinate from your uh, mobile device. You can also attach extra uh, external uh, GPS if you want to, uh, to increase um, the accuracy, but generally uh, a phone GPS uh, or a handheld GPS, a normal one is in the X and Y around uh, five meter accuracy. And in the Z, it is uh, three times less accurate. That has to do that the satellites are only uh, above us in the sky and not below. So the equations are, uh, have some inaccuracies when we solve them. So if you have a maximum of five meter accuracy in the X and Y, then your GPS Z coordinate is 15 meters less accurate. So you're plus or minus 15 meters. So keep that in mind that the GPS is not the best way to measure your altitude. A better way to do that is to use uh, barometric uh, methods where you have a, an altitude that works with uh, air pressure and you calibrate every day on a known point uh, where uh, what the elevation is. Other ways is to link the, the XY coordinates that you register to a digital elevation model with a high accuracy to get the elevation. That's something we will do in the last tutorial that we are going to sample the elevation from uh, boreholes. Um, as a backup uh, in your field forms, also your digital field forms, you would also have an X and Y field where you fill it in uh, manually, uh, just as a, as a backup. And you can read that from a second device that you use. Um, what is also important is that you know the projection in which you collect your, um, your GPS uh, coordinates because uh, they depend on the settings of the GPS. So always make sure that uh, they are in the correct settings and that if you fill in the values in a field form, uh, whether it's on paper or digitally, that you uh, also mention the projection that is used. That's very important, especially if you are in a big organization with many GPSs and you have to deliver it back. Uh, then afterwards, you don't know what the setting was. So some uh, other good practice advice with field data collection apps. As already said, and that's also for paper, make a good design prior to going to the field. That saves a lot of cost. Test your equipment before going to the field. Just go out, set, set up the, the app in your own environment where you live and test it, go out and uh, do some uh, sampling of wells. Even if there are no wells, just make some imaginary wells like uh, cars that are parked or find something just to test if everything works because you can still adjust if you're in your office or, or at home, but not when you're in the field, it will be very difficult. Take power banks because yeah, disadvantages of uh, uh, working digitally is that uh, yeah, you're very dependent on technology and technology needs power. Um, so power banks, chargers, maybe a car charger if you uh, drive around and a backup phone with the same software installed. So you can uh, always fall back on a, on a backup. As already said, uh, frequently make backups of the data collection in the cloud on a USB stick, uh, on your laptop that you might have in, in the car when you go on field data collection, uh, preferably on multiple sources because when data is lost, it's very expensive then to go back to the field and very annoying. 
especially if you have uh, interviews with people um, about their uh, water use, for example, then yeah, it's very annoying if you need to do that all again. Um, take care of that your data and GIS are not always available offline and that you need to uh, make them available offline if you expect uh, that you are in an area without network coverage or if you're depending on expensive bundles. And you will learn that today. And another one that's a bit more technical, but uh, often these apps uh, use some caching, which means that if you already opened the app uh, before going on your whole field uh, campaign and maybe in the same area and you've zoomed into the, to the area, that it will much quicker load when you go uh, surveying because it is already in the memory of the, of the phone. So uh, caching is, a, is an important thing to, to try to make it more smooth. If you have very big data sets on your phone, it will be very slow to collect the data. So also keep that in mind, not to make, make huge projects on your phone that need a lot of memory and loading and uh, downloading and synchronizing with the internet. And also check your memory availability on the device. It would also be very sad if you have this very heavy app on your phone and then you want to take field pictures, but they don't fit anymore in the memory on your phone. So that's also something to uh, take care of. So what we are going to do today is develop an app or configuring an app. It's a tool uh, which is called Input and it's developed by uh, Lutra Consulting. It's a great company that is located in the UK. And um, they developed a lot of nice things for QGIS. Uh, for example, the 3D view uh, and the mesh functionality in the newest versions to, uh, to have hydraulic model uh, outputs visualized in the QGIS. Um, that's all uh, their work, but also uh, the tools that we're going to use today. Um, the input app, uh, is designed to be compatible with all mobile devices. So it works both on, uh, on the Apple iPhone uh, as on uh, Android devices. Uh, you can find the app in the Google Play Store and in the App Store. The app is free and open source. So if you can program, you can customize it even further or install it in different ways or do branding. Um, it has support for custom forms. That's what you are going to uh, make today. And um, of course, capturing location related media, like uh, if you're in the field and want to take a picture or a video, you can store it as you can see there on the examples in the screenshots. Uh, that's also what we're going to configure today. It's very user friendly. So it is a whole QGIS project on your phone, but it looks very user friendly because it's adapted to, uh, to be used on your phone. It has support for external GPS receivers, uh, but it will otherwise use your mobile phone uh, location uh, services. And it has a setting that you can uh, check the accuracy of uh, the GPS with color codes. So you're on the screenshot on the right, uh, you see that uh, the GPS signal gives green, which means it's good. It has uh, like these traffic light uh, colors to indicate if you have a good or a bad reception. Now linked to this app, we also have the merging cloud service. Uh, that is where you synchronize your projects either from QGIS to the cloud or from the mobile phone to the cloud to exchange uh, the data. And it's a great uh, collaborative space where you can uh, log in together with people from your project and to share your QGIS projects. It has version management that works uh, very well if you uh, use geo packages. Then uh, as you see here on the screenshot, uh, different versions of the, the project uh, and you can uh, roll back to, to older versions. You can easily clone projects. So if you have a groundwater app for one area and you want to have another one for another area, you can simply clone the project. If other users are, uh, of your team are registered in uh, merging, you can easily share uh, your, your projects with other users by uh, simply uh, using their username and uh, sending them the message with the share uh, from the platform. It comes with a web client um, I'll show that also later in the demo. And it comes with a QGIS plugin that we use for synchronizing the different uh, projects uh, with the cloud. So the workflow that we are going to follow uh, today is this one. You design your project in the field forms and uh, put all your layers that you want to use uh, ready in a QGIS project. Then you use the merge-in plugin to synchronize that project with the merge-in cloud service. 
and then uh, you will find your project in the cloud service and uh, you can then check uh, if everything is there how big it is and, uh, and some other data and then we synchronize it to the mobile phone then you can do the field data collection and when you get back from the field after a field day or during the field day when you want to make a backup we reverse the approach so you have your mobile phone from the app you synchronize to the merging cloud and you use the merging plugin in QGIS and then back in QGIS you have your new points uh, added to your project uh, synchronized from the mobile app uh, via the cloud service so that's very uh, useful so if you go to the open courseware website then uh, like yesterday, uh, you will find this training, GIS training for hydrological applications uh, here. I would like to also point out that many other free courses are available here. So introduction to uh, ModFlow and Model Muse is quite useful for groundwater people. And um, yeah, a lot of nice things. Here's my uh, open courseware GIS course with a lot of new tutorials that are available. So uh, have a look at uh, all these free courses. You don't need to log in, you simply click on the course and uh, then you find the instructions. Now today we go to the field data collection tab and there you find this uh, tutorial to create a, a field data collection app for groundwater studies. Um, basically we're going to prepare uh, the project. We're going to add first the boundary of the study area because also in the field you want to see where the boundary is. We're going to add online layers uh, we're going to add uh, the OpenStreetMap layer and uh, Google Satellite. And we are also going to make those available for the project uh, offline. So we can use these layers in the field uh, when we have no internet connection. We're going to add a survey layer. That is where we design our field form. We're going to add map themes. Um, that is, these are presets of layers that uh, are taken over by the app. So you can choose the backgrounds that you want if you want uh, uh, Google Satellite as a background or OpenStreetMap. Uh, that's what you configure here. Then we will uh, synchronize the whole project with the merging cloud service. And uh, then we will synchronize to the app on the phone and do some uh, field survey, uh, which in the demo will be, of course, something uh, imaginary. And then we synchronize the survey back to QGIS and look at the results. And there's a link here to more resources. Um, there are lots of uh, other videos. I have a playlist on my YouTube channel. So you can have a look on, uh, at that. There's also another tutorial which focuses on some other aspects. Um, here we'll have uh, uh, the, the easy workflow for simple groundwater mapping, but you can extend it a lot with uh, other things uh, as you like, and you get more experience with the tool. So I'm going to move to uh, QGIS. So uh, have a new fresh uh, empty uh, QGIS. Uh, as I said uh, yesterday, you can move your layers panel over the browser panel. So you have these two tabs. I always find that very pleasant. And um, we're going to prepare uh, the project. We need to uh, look for the study area. And what we first need to do is set the projection of our project to the one that we are going to use in the project. And GPSs can be always set to UTM coordinates. And uh, yesterday we already used UTM coordinates. So I go here to the lower right. And when I click there, I can choose another projection of the project. And I'm going to filter uh, for the one that we need. And the EPSG code is 32736. Uh, there's a video on my YouTube channel uh, on uh, projections, uh, several videos there where you can also learn how to find these EPSG codes. It was also in, in your online course, uh, spatialreference.org, you can look them up. So selected here, you can see it's uh, over Malawi. So we are uh, looking at the same area in this uh, tutorial as uh, yesterday. I click OK. And now the projection of this empty project is now set to UTM. The next thing is that I need some reference. Um, there's a nice trick here in uh, coordinates. I can, this is not part of the tutorial, I just want to show that. You can use a world map. If I type world, you get a world map and you can use that as a base layer. That's not what I'm going to use now, so I'm going to remove it. 
because I want an OpenStreetMap background. I see that the um, on the fly projection has changed. So always keep an eye on that. Not sure why that happened. So I set it again um, because we're going to work in that projection. The next thing I'm going to install a plugin to have background layers. So I go to the plugins menu, manage and install plugins. And remember, you need an internet connection for that. I go to look for the quick map services plugin, this one. And this uh, nice plugin will give us access to all kinds of background layers. So I'm going to install this plugin. I can close uh, the dialog after it's successfully installed. And then I find here under web, I find quick map services. And it has this list of uh, online layers that we can use. But there's much more, and therefore you need to go to settings. In the settings, you can go to the tab more services. And then you click get contributed pack. And when you get this pop up last version uh, downloaded, you click OK and you click save here. And then under web, you find a lot of other resources. Today we're going to use two of them. We're going to use the Google satellite and we're going to use the OpenStreetMap. I'm going to start with OpenStreetMap for the reference and I load OSM standard. Now get the world map in uh, our projection. It depends a bit on the internet connection, how fast it loads. Um, but I'm interested in a specific area and uh, we're going to Malawi and I want to go to an area that is uh, close to the place Bangula. Now, how to find this place? There's a nice other plugin. I go to manage and install plugins and it's called the geocoding plugin. Here it is. And it uses uh, the Nominatim database from uh, OpenStreetMap and the Google Web Services to find addresses. So if you have streets and house numbers, you can even uh, look them up in the plugins. So I'm going to install this plugin. It's quite light. And it will simply add another button to your toolbar. This one, the geocoding icon. And I can look here for places. So I'm going to look for Bangula. I click OK and I get all the things that it found. There's uh, something that looks like it in Colombia. That's not the one that we need. I'm going to choose this first one, Mangula and Sanje in Malawi. And then I click OK and it will put a point on our map. I'm going to zoom in to the place. This point, by the way, is a memory layer. If you want to keep the point, you can export it like we learned yesterday to a geo package or a shapefile. Here we just need it for our reference to find the study area. And uh, this is the imaginary study area in the same bigger area that, uh, that we used yesterday. But that area of yesterday is uh, too big for the field survey. So uh, I also, for a demo, don't want to make it too big. So we are going to focus on this agricultural area where we have uh, pivots with uh, obviously uh, water use, maybe groundwater, maybe surface water. And we have some uh, lagoon here uh, with the Shire River. There's another river and we have the, the city there. So I found it, I can remove this uh, layer. We don't need it anymore. Okay. Um, I see it again changed the, the projection here. So I'm gonna change that again. Not sure why that's happening now, but anyways, keep an eye on that. Make sure that you have the UTM projection. Now the next uh, step is to define our study area. Well, normally you will have uh, a layer for that, or you can digitize a new layer. So you can under layer, create layer, uh, make a new geo package layer and then start digitizing. Here I'm going to simply use the extent of the uh, map canvas and use that as the boundary of our study area. So for that I go to the processing toolbox and there I'm going to look for a tool to find the extent. And there is uh, this tool, create layer from extent. It's under factor geometry. And you can always use the search box. 
And basically what this does is it will create a new polygon layer based on the extent. And therefore it's important that your projection here is correct because it will use those coordinates. So always click on these three dots to see what you can do. And there are some options here. If you have another layer, you can use that extent, but here I use the canvas extent. And it will simply use the corner coordinates and put it here in the extent field. And then I'm going to uh, save this to uh, a new uh, geo package. And I'm gonna work in that geo package further. So save to geo package. I'm going to make a new folder. Yesterday we learned some uh, good practice. So dedicated folder, tutorial two, I'm, I call it. And there I'm going to save it as a new uh, geo package, which we call um, Angula study area. And then a layer name. Oh, sorry, that was, that was the wrong one. I should of course uh, call uh, the, uh, the geo package uh, something else. Um, I see that's missing in the in the tutorial, but uh, that doesn't matter much. Uh, well, yeah, we can call it Bangula st study uh, area. And then we call the layer the same. So go back to Z's tutorial two. So notice that there's a, a difference between the, the geo package name and the layer name, but you can also give it the same name, Bangula study area. And then here also, Mangula study area. And there it is. And then I run and it creates a nice purple box there. Close the dialog. And if I zoom out, I can see indeed that it took the boundary coordinates and that's our study area. Let's uh, style it, go to the layer styling panel and there I change from simple fill to simple line. And let's make it red. All these styling will be taken over by uh, the app. So uh, that was the first step, adding the study area. Now I'm going to add layers, uh, online and offline layers. And um, Let's load a Google satellite uh, first to have a closer look at this area. So through the quick map services plugin, you go to Google and then to Google satellite. And the OSM is still on top, but here's the Google satellite. And if you zoom in, you can find a lot of uh, details here that are useful for our field survey. And we really want to use this online and offline. Well, using it online in the app is simply having it here in the layers list, uh, but having it offline, um, you need to process it a bit uh, further. So we have the OSM standard and the Google satellite, and we're going to make them both available um, for offline use. And then we need to determine the zoom level that we're going to use because you can imagine that this will generate a lot of data for your mobile phone if you want to use all these detailed tiles um, offline. And normally in the field, you are zoomed into a certain area and you want the detailed information specifically for that area and you don't need all the zoom levels. So I go here to view and to panels and then I'm going to add here tile scale. I close this uh, layer styling panel and the processing toolbox and here we see the tile scale and of course I have to select a layer that uses the tile scales and I can then move to different zoom levels. And this is important because it will give us the value. So if we move it, we see zoom level 17, for example, and that looks quite appropriate for our uh, project to use zoom level 17. So you use this tool to find the appropriate zoom level that has uh, just enough detail for you in the field. If you make it too uh, detailed, it will be a super big file with lots of tiles and too big for your phone. 
And if you make it uh, too small, then uh, you don't see anything. So here, uh, probably the optimum is around 17. Then uh, we're going to uh, process that into an offline file with, uh, with all these tiles. And we go back to the processing toolbox. I'm gonna close this tile scale processing toolbox. And there is a tool there to create MB tiles. It's this one. Before we do that, I want to zoom to our study area because it will use what we have here in the map canvas. And I'm going to remove the study area boundary. Otherwise it will also be in our tiles and uh, that's not what we want. And I'm going to double click on the tool. And uh, there we first going to set the extent. In this case, we are going to use the layer extent from the study area boundary. So the Bangula study area, there it is with the EPSG 32736 projection. And you can give a range of zoom levels that is for many other applications useful. And it will simply download uh, all the different zoom levels. But as said, we only want a detailed map and want to save space on our mobile phone. So I changed this to zoom level 17, both for the minimum and maximum. So we have only one zoom level and it will generate tiles. So it's quite efficient to uh, visualize on your mobile phone. I keep the other things as default and I'm going to write uh, the output file. Save to file. You cannot save it directly to a geo package. We'll uh, convert it later to the geo package. And uh, I'm just gonna call this uh, satellite. There it is. And then I uh, run it. That will take a little bit. It will now uh, download all these tiles within the study area boundary from the internet and save it to the MB tiles file so you can use it offline. And later we are going to repeat this procedure for the OpenStreetMap. You can do this for any uh, online file. So uh, the app uh, also supports WFS from GeoNode. So if you have already data on uh, the SADC uh, GIP, you can add it to your QGIS project and use the layers on your mobile phone, even with a live connection with the SDI. So that might be something uh, useful. Okay, it's done. I can close it. You see that it's ready now. Uh, this big file has been uh, downloaded. It's not automatically added to your layers list. So, uh, so I'm going here to the browser panel and um, I'm going to add it to, uh, to the geo package. So first I'm gonna find it in the tutorial two folder. Here. And here we see our geo package with the study area. And we see here the MB tiles. It comes with two files, but the, ones that, the one that we need is the, the raster. And we can simply drag it to our geo package and then it will be imported. It will take a little bit, these are big files. And it needs to convert the format to be compatible with the geo package. Okay, it says import was successful. So that's great. Um, so we see here satellite, so that's good. And I can uh, already drag it here to the map canvas and then it will load. There it is. It looks a bit bad, but remember we have a very high zoom level. So if I remove here the Google satellite and I'm going to zoom in, then you see what we have created. And this is zoom level 17. Got a little bit compressed, but uh, good enough. If you're not uh, happy with it, you can increase the zoom level, but remember it will make the file bigger. But this will be already good if we're walking around here to know that if we are next to a tree, we can already see it or the roads. So let's do the same for the OSM standard. Um, so we're going to add the OpenStreetMap there. I can't see it because this one is on top. There is it. And in the same way, I'm going to determine the zoom level. So I go here to the view, panels, tile scale. And again, we're going to determine which zoom level is best to use. And also there 17 or 16 seem to be okay. Um, I'm just gonna take uh, 16 here. 
but 17 would also be good. It uh, depends a bit on what you like, uh, the amount of detail that you see here. So go back to the processing toolbox. Again, generate the X, Y, Z tiles, double click. Use the layer extent of our boundary from the study area, change the zoom level. I'm gonna use here 16. Keep the defaults. And I'm going to save this one to uh, OSM. And uh, there we go. And it will download now the tiles from OSM. It's much faster because there's a different type of data. And it's done. I close the dialog. I go to the browser panel. I see here the OSM MB tiles. I drag it into our geo package so it will be imported. And the import was successful. And uh, what we can do now is drag also the OSM layer in the map canvas. So if I remove this, then you see we have the study area uh, with the OSM study area boundary. And we have the satellite layer, which is loading. If you zoom in, it will be faster because of all the tiles. It will only show the ones that's in your uh, zoom level. And we have the online layer and we have the online satellite layer. And uh, what we can do now is uh, save the project. And we can save it to a geo package, but uh, the input app does not support the project in the geo package. So what you need to do is save your project in a normal project file. And I go here to Z tutorial two, and I'm going to save this one um, as uh, Bangula groundwater. And now it's a QGZ file. Now the next uh, step is that we are going to add the so-called survey layer. So we have the boundary, we have the online and offline background layers from OpenStreetMap and from the Google Satellite. But now we also want a layer that we're going to use for surveying with all the field forms. So I'm going to close the processing toolbox and um, I'm going to add a new layer. So you simply go here to layer, create layer. And we're going to create a new geo package layer. And I'm going to connect to the database. There it is. And I'm going to give this a new name. And you can give this layer a name, uh, survey or something else. Define the geometry. It's point geometry. We are going to uh, map points. Input also allows a mapping of lines and polygons, but in most cases you will have points. Change the projection to the one you're going to use in the field. So that's the one of the project. And now we are going to add the different fields that we need. And uh, in the tutorial, you can see the whole list. I'm going to add them one by one. So the first one is that I want an observation ID. And that will be uh, an integer number. If you have codes with uh, letters, you choose text. I will here just use a simple integer number. Um, the geo package comes with also a, a feature ID uh, built in uh, number, but that's automatically controlled. And uh, you might in the field want to give your own numbers. Uh, also, if you uh, make mistakes with numbering or, or anything else. So I'm going therefore to add this observation ID field define it as a whole number and never forget to click this list at two fields. And the next one that I need, I want also to register in the field, the date and the time. I'll just call it date. And the type is date and time. Time is important because uh, yeah, it gives us extra information on the conditions in the field if you add the time and you can synchronize it with other time dependent data such as data loggers. 
So add it to the list. Then, of course, I want also to know who is the observer because you want to maybe work in a team and use the field form with different people and different people observe in different ways. So it's always important to add an observer name. That will be text data. So I'll add it. Then I want also a picture. And for picture, we put text data because basically it will be a link to a file on in your project and on your phone uh, that will be used later. So uh, always configure picture as a text data. If you want multiple pictures, then you need to define for each picture uh, a field. You cannot store multiple pictures in one field. That is a, a limitation. But if you want 10 pictures, then you just uh, make a field picture one, picture two, etc. Then uh, as a backup, I want the X coordinate that we read from, a, from an other GPS or from a map. And that will be a real number, decimal number. And I add it to the list. Same for the Y coordinate. Also a real. I also want the Z, the elevation. Maybe we have a barometer in the field, an altimeter, and we can read that, or we do a rough estimate from the GPS. And that's also a real. Then I want to know the type of feature. Is it a spring or a borehole or a well? And that will be a text format. You can also encode it in numbers, but let's do text here so we can see it in a written word. Add it to the field list. For those fields, I also want to know the depth. And that will be a real number. You might want to enable uh, to use uh, decimals for that. So edit. In the field form, we can determine the units that you will use. Then uh, we want to know the groundwater level for wells and boreholes. Also a decimal. Uh, we want to know name. Maybe uh, we are in a compound of somebody and we want to uh, have some reference so we can put a name there, text data. I can uh, edit and maybe also have the address. If you want to go back, you can easily find it back. Also text data. And it's always good practice to add an extra field, which is called remarks or notes, where you can uh, write other things that are not captured by uh, the field form and that you might want to capture. So you're completely free to design this in the way you want, but you need to think in advance what kind of fields do you want. And um, now this, these are all the fields, so I do OK. And it will ask now to uh, override the database or add the new layer. We want to add this empty layer to our geo package. So I do add new layer. And there it is. If I open the attribute table, I can find here all the fields that we have added in attribute table, uh, table format. The next step is that I want to have a marker. So the input app also takes the styling that we uh, use here in this project. So I'm going to change the styling. I go to the layer styling panel and I'm going to change these markers to a combination of two simple markers. So I'm gonna click the plus button. So I have now two simple markers. I'm first going to style the first one. And what I'm going to uh, do there is to make the fill color transparent. And I'm going to make the stroke color black. It's already black. And I'm going to make uh, the size uh, a bit bigger. So let's make this one uh, four millimeters. And I'm going to make the stroke width a bit thicker. And I'm going to put that to one millimeter. And I'm going to use the second simple uh, marker. What I'm going to design is a, is a crosshair because that's easy in the, in the field. So what we're going to do there is uh, I'm going to uh, choose another marker symbol there. I'm going to choose the, the cross so we get the crosshair, but of course it needs to be much bigger. And I'm going to change some uh, sizes in here. So I want the size of the crosshair to be uh, eight millimeters. And I want 
also the stroke so it's clearly visible in the uh, in the field the stroke width i'm going to change this to also one millimeter and now we have a nice uh, crosshair that's very clearly uh, visible when we are in a field under conditions where we have a lot of sunlight so you can take care of that but feel free to make any kind of symbol that uh, that you want so that's uh, the styling that is uh, defined and let's frequently save uh, the project also so now the styling is also there saved with the project and the next step is to design our uh, field form and that's a nice functionality that you might not know in uh, QGIS. Uh, it's to, uh, to design widgets. So I click right and I go to the layer properties of our survey layer. And when you are there, you see many options. And one of the options that you probably have not uh, used is attributes form. And what we see there is uh, widgets and our different fields that we have defined. And we are going to define a widget for each field and the input app will take over those widgets. So FID is the internal numbering of the geo package. And uh, we don't want that to, uh, to be visible. So the widget type here, we change this one to hidden. And that's the only thing we need to change for the FID. For the observation ID, we are we can put an alias an alias is what is visible in the field form so on the phone and in the form attribute table in the form view which i will show later and we can call this uh, observation number so people can see that name there and what we are also going to change there is uh, the widget type it should be uh, text edit so for numbers and for text we all use text edit it's just simple uh, entry field that we want and I want to have a constraint I want that every field observation has an observation number so you can under constraints put here not null and you can enforce the constraint so you cannot save the, the observation without putting the observation number if you enforce this if you only have checked not null it will uh, indicate that it's a mandatory field but you can still uh, continue with that so that's okay for the observation ID. Let's go to the date. And there I want an alias date and time. Oops, typo. And I changed the widget to date and time, but it's already there because our data type was already date and time. It uh, recognizes it. But the display uh, has a format that we might not want to use. So we can change that to a custom format. And if you click this button, you see a lot of options to uh, customize it. Here, I want the day in a number. I want the month in a number. And while I'm building this, you can see the preview here. And I want to have the year in four numbers. So that's uh, today's date. And then I want the time in 24 hour notation. And I want the minutes and I want the seconds. So this is how you can build a custom field. And we don't uh, need the calendar pop up. Uh, the, uh, the app will simply have a button to add the current date. And that's what we configure here under uh, defaults. The default value will be now. Dollar now is a function to have the current date and time. So if I type here dollar now, I can see the current date and the time uh, expressed. And in the app, it will also use that one uh, when you collect uh, a data point. So the default value will be the current date and time. The next is observer. And I'm going to use there uh, as an alias the observer name. And that is a text edit, that's okay. And you can put there a default value. So not every time you have to fill that in. So I can use my own name, but you use the single quote because it is a, it is like a, a it is a string and for strings into these kind of uh, uh, fields. As you have learned, we use single quotes and I can then type my name. OK. 
close with a single quote and then you see in the preview my name without those quotes. So uh, that's our observer name. Then for the picture, we need to uh, change a few things. The widget type for the picture is the attachment. And we need to change there to relative paths because on your phone, it will have a different uh, path. So it's important to change that. And the other thing we need to change there is uh, the widget type, uh, sorry, the content type is an image. And we keep uh, the other things as default, so an auto size based on uh, the size of your screen or the size uh, in the attribute table uh, related to your picture. And this one I'm not gonna make uh, mandatory. So uh, just to also to play with that, we don't have to fill in an uh, alias, we can just use a picture. And then I go, well, can in between click on apply, so it will be applied. I go to X coordinate, um, leave the default text edit, and I don't need uh, constraints. The same for the Y coordinate, uh, also no constraints. For Z, I'm gonna change the alias to elevation in meters. So always make clear what kind of units you want in the, uh, uh, in the field form, so people don't make mistakes there. No constraint. Then we go to type. And the type uh, needs to be uh, a list that people can choose from. So I'm gonna change first the alias to feature type. And I'm going to change the widget type to value map. And what a value map does, it will map a description what you will see in the field form to a value what will be substituted in your attribute table. So we could, if we would have numbers, we could say number one is a well. So when people choose well, it will substitute number one in the attribute table. In our case, we chose to have text and we can uh, then keep them the same in this case. So choice number one is the borehole. And in the field form, it should also show up as borehole that people can select from a drop down menu. Second one is a well. Third one is a spring. And don't forget to also uh, have an other field if there's something else and you want to be flexible in the field, we use other. And um, we want to enforce this choice, so it cannot be null and it needs to be enforced. Then we go to uh, the next one, that's the depth. And we're going to change the alias to depth to bottom in meters. So make again clear what you mean. It should be a text. And there are some constraints there because we don't want that for springs. So I'm going to build an expression here under constraints. You can open this expression dialog by clicking this button. And I go to fields and values. And I want that uh, type equals boreholes. Or type equals wells. You can see that it's uh, valid. You can make it a little bit bigger so you can read it. So only when the type equals boreholes or the type equals wells, we can fill in the depth to the bottom. If it's a spring or other, we cannot. So do OK. And then it's filled in here. And um, you can add a description here to explain what you meant with that. That's just for, uh, for a reference. If another person reads why you've put there and then say uh, depth only for boreholes or wells. 
and you can enforce the constraint. And we do the same for the groundwater level. So that would be the water level in the well or the borehole in meters. It's a text field. And I want to have, again, that expression. I go back to depth and I simply copy the expression and paste it in here. And also I can do that with a part of this one. Level only for boreholes and wells and enforce this choice and apply and then we go to the next one name that is uh, something we can keep with the text edit and for address that might be a bit longer so i'm going to change this i keep it text edit but i want it multi-line so you can have a bit more space in the field form to uh, to write the complete address and i'll do the same for remarks also want it multi-line i do apply And now I can uh, click OK. And if I now open the attribute table, you see here the table view, but maybe you have noticed the, these two buttons on the bottom. If I click this button, then we have the form view. And here we see our field form. It's empty because we have no uh, entries here, but this will also be used by uh, the app. And then you can when you synchronize back, you can visualize the result in this form view. So remember that these two buttons are to toggle between the table and the form view. Now there's one more uh, step that we can do here um, to add the map themes, because we want to give the user of the app the choice to uh, switch between online and offline maps and between OpenStreetMap and Google Satellite. Um, and therefore we use a function that is called map themes. So what I want to do first is to, uh, to rename a few uh, layers here. So rename, just to make it clear for ourselves because we can get uh, confused. So this is uh, satellite online. That's what we are looking at. And I can save it here as, oh yeah, uh, keep an eye on the order. The survey layer needs to be on top. And then uh, we can use the boundary and then we have the layer uh, under it that we want to, uh, to visualize. So go to this button and I'm going to add theme. And I'm going to call this one satellite online. The user will have the same choice there. I will, I will show that later. Now we have OpenStreetMap. I'm going to rename that layer too. Call this one OpenStreetMap Online. And I'm going to add it also as a separate theme. I'm going to call the theme OSM Online. We also have the OSM Offline. So I'm going to rename this. And I'm going to add this one to a map theme, OSM offline. And we have the offline satellite. I'm going to rename it to satellite offline. That's the layer name. And I'm going to add a name of the theme, satellite offline. Now, what's the use of this? I can choose a map theme and it will automatically select the layers that we have chosen. And uh, the app will take over those settings. So I'm going to uh, now uh, save uh, this uh, project. And um, 
The next step is to synchronize this with the uh, merging plugin and then to synchronize this with uh, the input app. There's a link in the tutorial where you can go to the cloud service of uh, Mergin. And uh, that's a service provided by uh, Lutra Consulting. And you can um, sign up here to, uh, to get access. If you scroll down, it gives a little explanation on, uh, on how it works, what the main features are, how to use it, which I will also explain. And the plugin that will come in a bit the mobile app that you will use. But if you scroll all the way to the bottom, then you can see that uh, it is free to use in a community uh, license where uh, you will get 100 megabytes of storage, which is sufficient for this project that we are doing here, uh, where you can have unlimited public and un unlimited private projects. But you might want to have more space if you, your uh, mapping projects are bigger, so then it has some different uh, licenses. Uh, that you can uh, go for, but you can also choose to have it installed on your own servers and uh, customized. And uh, I'm always imagining that it would be very nice to connect it to an uh, SDI. So you have the, the mapped data in some way uh, collected also um, live put on your, your SDI. So these things are all, all possible, but yeah, these companies, they, uh, they provide you services. And of course that comes at a cost, but the great thing for us is that the basic uh, license already offers us enough to, uh, to experience uh, the product. So after you have uh, signed up with a username and a password, then uh, you can use the plugin in uh, QGIS. So I'm going to switch now to the other screen. Okay, so uh, once you have configured your username and password in the Mergin uh, cloud service on the web, you need to install the Mergin plugin. You go to plugins, manage and install plugins. And there you're going to look for merging. Here it is. And then you install the plugin. And then you can close this. After installing the plugin, you, you need to restart your QGIS because otherwise you don't see it here in the browser panel. There it is. I open the recent project. And there it is. And now we see that we have the merging uh, group here in our browser panel. I can expand it, but I need to configure it first. So I click right, I go to configure, and there it asks me my username and my password. That's what you just registered for. You can choose to save your credentials, so you don't have to put that uh, there uh, every time. You can test the connection, and it says OK. And uh, here's another way to sign up if you ha don't have an account yet. It will bring you to the same uh, website. I click OK. And now it will show me uh, my projects shared with me and explore. My projects are the ones that I already have in the cloud service. Shared with me is uh, our projects that are specifically shared with me from the cloud service. So if you work in a team, you can share your project with a specific other uh, user in Mergin and explore our public projects that you can just use to uh, figure out uh, how it works, or maybe you find some useful uh, uh, project that's already made for your purpose. Now what uh, we need to do is to uh, initiate our uh, project. And the first thing that we need to do is to clean up the folder with our project. And here we see the folder. And basically the only thing we need is QGZ, the project file and the geo package. When you have your project open, QGIS will also have these temporary files related to your geo package. You leave them there, don't remove them. But we don't want these MB tiles because they're already in our geo package. So I'm going to select them and delete. Uh, so we only have these ones left over. And then when we synchronize, Mergin knows that it needs to take the geo package and the project file. So Make sure that you remove the files that you don't need. Otherwise, it will take up space in the cloud, but also on your mobile phone. So if I would have kept these MB tiles, it will make the file uh, three, three times bigger than, uh, than I need. And also for your internet connection, it, uh, it's heavier. So basically, this folder is going to be shared with uh, Mergin. So there's one more setting that you uh, need to do before you can use your QGIS project uh, in uh, on your mobile phone as a survey project. 
because how does the tool now know which layer is the survey layer? Because these are both vector layers that you can, uh, can use. Um, so you need to go to the project properties. And there you can go to the data sources. And the rule is that it will identify the uh, survey layer if it is not read only. So we need to put the other vector layers on read only. That's an important uh, setting. Otherwise this uh, study area polygon will also become a survey layer and you can add uh, data to that. And that's not of course the purpose. So put that one on read only, but keep the survey layer as uh, also writable. So okay, save the project and go back to merge in. Then I'm going to create a new project, project name, Angula groundwater mapping. Make it public, initialize from the local drive. And there I go to the folder. Tutorial two, select folder, click OK. And it will now connect to the cloud and upload my project. That will take a bit based on the size of your project and uh, your internet connection. This is not a very big project. So uh, it says it's uploaded successfully. Click uh, close. And then I find it under my projects here at the top, Mangula groundwater mapping. It shows this folder symbol, which means you also have it as a local folder. And these other ones, I don't have it locally and they are only in the cloud and then I can uh, synchronize it. So let's uh, confirm that uh, this project is now in the cloud. So I go to uh, the merging cloud and I'm going to uh, sign in. And I see here the Bangula groundwater mapping project. Its size, it's only 30 uh, megabytes. And uh, this means that it is uploaded in the cloud and uh, it's completely uh, synchronized. Here I see the files, the geo package and the project file, and it all looks okay. With this button, you can uh, share it with others. There are uh, all kinds of settings that you can do, including deleting it. Uh, you can clone this project and you can make it private. And there's a history to track the changes. Well, there are two files added and for the rest, nothing happened. Okay, now um, our project is uh, synchronized with the cloud. So the only next step to do is that we need to um, use it on the mobile phone. And there uh, I have downloaded the input app from the apps uh, store. It works on uh, both um, Android and on, uh, on the iPhone. And I tap the input app and it brings me to the home uh, uh, screen and there you can for the first time you need to log into your account in my case I'm already logged in so I don't uh, change anything here but you have to first log in when you're logged in you can find on the home screen uh, your active projects that you're working on and you can then go to my projects there and under my projects, you see all the projects uh, that you have in the cloud. And you can see with uh, different icons here, uh, this one is synchronized. And these ones I can download to the phone. So here on the top of the list, we see my a new uh, project for groundwater mapping that I just made. And uh, I can now simply tap that it will download uh, the project. That takes a bit, depending on the speed of your phone, the size of the project and your uh, internet connection that you're using on the phone. So do that prior to going to the field because you also want to test it first before using it. And then it will uh, download to the file system of your mobile phone. Almost there. There it is. So we now see this nice sign here that it is uh, synchronized. What I do now, I go back to my home screen and I find there this new project. So it's uh, this one that we have just downloaded and now I'm going to tap it to open it.
So here we see our project with the bounding box that we created and the GPS location. And I can zoom in further on the OpenStreetMap offline layer. And I can look at the different uh, map themes and try them out. So let's put a satellite image in the background. Uh, use the offline one and that all seems to work well. Remember that you need to uh, zoom in very well to use the satellite uh, layer, otherwise uh, it needs to load a lot of uh, detailed tiles that you're not uh, using. So only use the satellite background uh, when you're really zoomed in in an area that you're going to map. I can see the status of the GPS is green. If you go here to more and then to settings, you can see here different color codes for the GPS accuracy. And you can set there the threshold to give a warning that it, the signal is bad. Um, I keep it as default here. If you switch on follow GPS with map, that is when you are driving around or uh, moving around, then uh, the maps will follow your GPS uh, signal, which is good for navigating. I switched it off now. So let's add a point. When I tap record, I get uh, the point at the GPS location. But sometimes you need to move it. For example, if you observe something behind uh, a fence or you can't access the well, then you simply move it with your fingers to the right spot and then you tap add point. Now you see the field form and we can fill it in. Let's start with an observation number. I put one and it automatically fills in the date and time uh, that you have now. But if you tap the calendar icon, it will update the time When we scroll down, we can take the picture. Here I'll make a selfie. And then you tap OK. And the picture is added to the field form. You can fill in the coordinates, that's optional here. And uh, I choose borehole, then it's mandatory to also fill in uh, the depth and the water level, which in the case of spring uh, we wouldn't do. I can fill in there a name and address and give a remark. If everything's okay in the form, let's double check. Then I uh, tap save and the point is stored. And we see there the crosshair appearing at the spot that we have indicated. It's not very clear in this forested background. So you might want to go back to your project and stay, uh, change the colors. You will see that if I use another map theme, uh, OpenStreetMap offline, for example, that it's uh, much more visible there. So um, we have added this point. If I know uh, I can collect more points, but uh, for the demo, this is okay. I go back to projects and then I move to my projects and there I see uh, the project and I can tap the arrows to synchronize it back with the merging cloud. So that's a quick update because it just needs to send the changes. And when you see the that green icon, it means that it's correctly synchronized and we can proceed on the desktop. Uh, you have some other functionality here. You can go to the shared uh, tab if things are personally shared with you and you have the explore tab where you can look at other merging projects that are public and, uh, and use those. Yeah. So that was the mobile phone part. So I'm going to stop sharing the mobile phone. And going to prove that it's uh, synchronized. So we're back from the imaginary uh, fieldwork and to go to my uh, merge in the browser and there is the project and I click synchronize and it will download the new project data and the pop-up says that the synchronization has been successful and there I open the project from merge and when I open the attribute table I see now that the fields are filled in and when I maximize it, uh, I can see there uh, the data that has been captured.